four. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have a full house. We will start off with prayer and pledge. Today we have Reverend Father Ryan Rojo, the parochial vicar, Cathedral of the Sacred Heart. Would you please come forward and lead us in prayer? You want to come over here? Okay. Let us pray. God of mercy and justice, thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the, po the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service. Remind us that we are stewards of your authority. Guide us to be the leaders your people need. Help us to see the humanity and dignity of those who disagree with us, and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. And finally, Father, renew us with the strength of your presence and the joy of helping to build a community worthy of the human person. We ask this as your sons and daughters, confident in your goodness and love. Amen. Hale Neighbors here, please. Come on up here. Did I pronounce that right? Well, it's a pretty name. You want to kind of stand on your feet? Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Texas SBDC Network provides small business assistance starting and growing Texas's small businesses. The 2007 record year for Texas SBDCs shows clients created 15,135 jobs, assessing capital of $518 million with new sales of $1.0 billion. David, would you please come forward? <coughs> How are you today? Good. Good to have you here. SBDC Day is a national collective proclamation of the success and impacts America's small business development centers have across the nation in economic development and the small business community. The Angelo State University SBDC continues to demonstrate the hard work and commitment that has helped Texas become the nationwide leader in job creation and small business growth. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas do hereby proclaim March 21st, 2018 as Texas Small Business Development Center Day. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank Would you? you. Okay. Thank, you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mary, very much uh, for this, and thank you for your commitment to small businesses, which is well known, and also thank the city council and the city staff for their commitment and support of small businesses and for our program, the ASU Small Business Development Center. So thank you.
think there's some folks here for the historic Fairmont Cemetery. If you would come forward, I would greatly appreciate it. Lots of room back here. <laughs> Whereas the city of San Angelo purchased 22.5 acres south of the city limits in 1893 to establish a new cemetery, and whereas Elise Bond, wife of a city elderman, was on March 1, 1893, the first person interred in the burial grounds, later to be named Fairmont Cemetery at the suggestion of Lila Hill, a member of the Women's Executive Board that oversaw the graveyard's operation. Whereas today, historic Fairmont Cemetery occupies 57 lovely acres in the heart of San Angelo and is the final resting place of more than 33,000 people, including veterans of every war since the Battle of San Jacinto, community stalwarts with familiar surnames such as Hart, Nasworthy, Mertz, Harris, Bryan, Shannon, Mathis, and Carr, along with people from all walks of life, and whereas Fairmont Cemetery, even on this, the 125th anniversary of its founding, remains a vital community asset that under the able guidance of the Fairmont Cemetery Board and with the unwavering support of the Friends of Fairmont still has approximately 400 available grave spaces, another 400 niches for ash and remains, and bold plans for future improvements to the site. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March 2018 as Hysteric Fairmont Cemetery Month in San Angelo, Texas, and call upon all citizens to visit this cherished jewel in our community to soak in its history, its beauty, and its peacefulness. Who would like to speak? I'd like to thank the Mayor and the City Council for its recognition today on Fairmount's 125th anniversary. I'd like to recognize some of the people here with me today. First, I'd like to recognize Jeremy Walker, our cemetery supervisor who along with its staff do a remarkable job managing the day-to-day -day business of the cemetery. I'd also like to recognize these women up here behind me who represent not only the board of Fairmount Cemetery but also friends of Fairmount who work tirelessly and contribute countless volunteer hours not only in preserving the history of Fairmount but also promoting its viability as a future resting place for generations to come. We welcome everybody to come visit Fairmount Cemetery we have walking tour maps available at the cemetery office on Avenue N across from the cemetery. We welcome everyone to come enjoy its grounds. Thank you. Okay. Well, good morning. How are you? Good to see you. We are now going to have a recognition of the Parks and Recreation Department, so I'm not sure who all is going to come forward, but if you would, please.
San Angelo's dog park is already a winner with the city's canine companions. Now it is with a state group of park professionals as well. The city's Parks and Recreation Department has won the annual Park Development Innovations Award for 2018 for its development of the dog park. The award was announced at the annual gathering of the Texas Recreation and Park Society in Waco on March 1st. Citizens had long expressed a desire for a dog park. Four years ago, Girl Scout Megan Algier adopted a dog park as her goal project. She raised $66,000 towards the effort. The city matched the funds with $12,000 and tabbed the park's division with designing, coordinating, and completing the project, which was finished in the fall of 2017. As part of his Eagle Scout project, Boy Scout Slade Shelton created a commons area to enhance the dog park. Located at 3215 Millbrook Drive, the dog park is perfectly placed near the popular Unidad Park, the Red Arroyo Trail, and a residential neighborhood. The two-acre park has fenced areas specifically for small dogs and for big dogs. For its human visitors, it offers convenient parking, walkways, landscaping, restrooms, seating, and shade. It is a hit with man's best friend and with man. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby recognize and applaud the Parks and Recreation Department for its achievement and positive determination to make a difference in our community. Thank you. Uh, I was part of the design team, but I think it was definitely a team effort, beginning with the Girl Scout, working with the Parks crew to make it all come together, and then the Boy Scout to finish it off. It's been a great uh, success for the community and happy to be a part of it. I'm Roger Homlock. I'm the park superintendent with the city of San Angelo. I'd like to recognize our staff. Uh, we have Mike Hitchcock, who's the parks manager. We also have the facility supervisor, Michael Dennis. Uh, we also have Tony Harris, who was the irrigation and uh, horticulture coordinator at that time. He's now the landscape coordinator. And then we have Mario DeLeo. Uh, he's also, uh, he was the landscape coordinator at that time. He's now one of our supervisors. And I'd like to give a special recognition uh, to uh, a gentleman who recently retired with over 30 years with the City of San Angelo Parks Department, Salvador San Sanchez. Uh, he's been instrumental and just a huge, played a huge role with many of the projects that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis for years and years. And he's just done a wonderful job. I'd like to congratulate him at this time too. So thank you. We have someone from Lake Nasworthy Homeowners Association. All San Angeloans are proud of the natural beauty that surrounds our amazing community and the residents of Lake Nasworthy understand how vital protecting that natural beauty is to the future of this community. The Lake Nasworthy Homeowners Association is embarking on a grassroots effort to keep their neighborhood clean. The association's efforts, led by past president Rick Abbott, provide for 10,000 free and biodegradable trash bags for use at the lake. 
The vision includes engaging nearby businesses and gate attendants who will provide trash bags to lake patrons in hopes of encouraging everyone to do their part keeping the lake area clean. Future projects related to the distribution of trash bags include potential use of distribution stands and trash receptacles at each boat ramp for the circulation of trash bags. In addition, they plan on partnering with existing organizations to arrange annual trash pickup public service days designated after big events at the lake, such as the annual fireworks display. The association understands the need may become necessary for additional new creative partnerships with local businesses depending on the future costs of providing this program. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby recognize and applaud the Lake Nasworthy Homeowners Association for their positive determination and ongoing pledge to keep Lake Nasworthy beautiful and make a difference in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Did you bring one of those bags to show? Yes, I've, I've, I've got a bag. If Would, it yeah, I'd love for you to show it because I think it's very clever. Come on up. You gotta do show and tell. <laughs> You'll be Vanna, <laughs> and we have. <laughs> yes, can you? <laughs> this is the actual size and color and everything of the bag. What it's going to say is uh, different than this one. This was one that came off the Frio River. Ours is there will be here in about two weeks. But ours are going to say, sack it, don't sink it. And that's our, our goal is for people to put their trash in sacks and then let's do it something, do it something with it once we've got it. Uh, I just visited with the fellow who's over the maintenance and the ongoing operations of the boat races last Friday. And he's very excited that we've already got, we've got somebody on board right there that's going to pass out a bunch of sacks for us at the boat races. So we're, we're excited to get going on this. We just think it's something that Lake Nasworthy needs. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We will now open up for public comment. Issues or items that are not on the agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, begin by stating their name, and limit remarks to less than three minutes. Council members may request that a discussed item be placed on a future agenda. The council takes public comment on all regular agenda items during the discussion of those items. At this point, I would also like to remind everybody to put their cell phones on silence. And I ask for people to please come forward with public comment if you have one. Good morning. My name is John Cross. I'm the CEO of Lone Star Beef. <coughs> I know a few of you on the, the council. I'm here this morning. A lot of people don't know about us, uh, and we try to keep it that way most of the time. But we're the largest blue collar employer in the city of San Angelo. Approximately 600 jobs out there, $35 million payroll. We pay a lot of taxes. Our streets are third world out there. We have potholes that you can walk in that are ankle deep. The rest of the streets are destroyed out there. Now, We've been told for 10 years Bell Street was on the project list, but it's going to stop at the railroad tracks now. Now, we also have probably 500 trucks a week in and out of our facility that 
probably another four or 500 sand trucks a week. Additionally, between the traffic coming in from Abilene going to the stockyards, um, many facilities, that individual street north of that railroad tracks, there's almost a thousand jobs out there. So we, we, we call, they'll send a truck out, a little dump truck, throw a little blacktop in a hole, and three weeks later it's gone. Or they run a little oil in the sand, it's gone in two months. And the, and the streets are just pitiful. And, and it's just, you know, we, we read in the paper where you're going out and trying to bring in new businesses and you'll spend money, but why not spend it on the companies that are here? So I'm not sure who, who I can follow up with to try and get this completed. I mean, even if you came out and chewed it up and made it a gravel road, it'd be better than what we have. And so, I mean, many of you have been out there, you know the facilities. Um, it's, it's just pitiful to think that we're in a nice city like it is trying to grow, and yet we're sitting out here uh, with just, just a third world facility on the roads. So anyway, that's, that's why I'm here this morning. And um, if there's somebody, I'll, I'll probably follow up with Lucy since she's our, <coughs> our uh, council member. But anyway, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, John. John, if you would, uh, we have Shane Kelton back there. He can visit with you as well. Shane Kelton, he's over operations. Uh, he'll get with you in just a little bit, okay? John, I'm also glad that you spoke because today, I believe, is National Agricultural Day. And I want to make sure that we, as a council, recognize that and talk ab about the importance of agriculture in the state of Texas, but the importance of agriculture to the citizens of San Angelo and the city of San Angelo. Thanks to all of you that are involved in that industry for your work, your hard work, and what you produce and bring to the table for us. Thank you very much. I also want to make note today that this is na um, March is National Women's Month, and I want to thank all the women that are in the audience, all the women who are listening, who are also part of our city, and who have contributed so much to the quality of life that we have here. Your work, your energy, your efforts, your brilliance, and the families you raise are very important to all of us sitting here and the rest of the city. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Steve Hampton. Uh, I would like to know more about the, uh, the Ford Ranch uh, hiring of the, of the lawyer. It says... Uh, well, We're not in the consent agenda fine. yet. Are you, is that what you're talking about? I'm sorry? Are you wanting to talk about items on the consent agenda? Yes, I am. Well, we will discuss the consent agenda in a minute. Right now, we're just doing overall public comment. You can go ahead and finish your comments now, but... I don't know if you want to wait for consent agenda okay. items. Uh, I just want it to be pulled uh, and moved to where we can discuss it before it's uh, voted on. And uh, that would be 5J, I mean uh, 5D and 5J about the, and that's Article 4A11.000. Uh, Thank you. So, Steve, you want to pull 5 D and what else? 5D and 5J okay. uh, number four about the uh, fire and rescue service <laughs> fee. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have further public comment? With no further public comment, we will close public comment at this point in time and move into the consent agenda. I will start with Tommy Hebert. Do you have anything that you want to pull from consent agenda? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Harry? No, ma'am. Lucy? No, ma'am. Lane? Uh, J3. And Billy? Uh, yes, item D and item uh, J4. So with those items being pulled, we, I would be asking for a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item D, <coughs> item J, 
three and four. To approve as presented. Do I have a second? Second. With all of, um, do I have any further public comment on consent agenda? With no further comment on consent agenda, we will take a vote and approve the rest of the consent agenda, excluding items D, items J, three and four. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Any nays? Consent agenda is approved. We will then move to item D. Item D is consider hiring local attorney Arthur Ohl for consultation on matters related to oil and gas exploration, range land management, and other matters necessary for the preparation of the Ford Ranch. Teresa, you're on. I'm not sure what the question is, but Arthur Uhl is a board certified real estate attorney who helped us on the acquisition. He was subcontracted under Lloyd Gosling at that time, and we feel it's more appropriate for him to directly contract with the city rather than be a sub for another attorney. He, is, he does have a big office in San Antonio, but also has a local office. He offices out of the Wells Fargo um, building, and he also has a local ranch. So he has been invaluable in understanding um, the process and the land and how ranches operate in this region of Texas. Does council have any comments on item D? Move um, approval item D. Second. Public comment. Uh, this has a, a multitude of uh, a multitude of uh, different parts to it. Uh, uh, is uh, has. Do you have any reason to feel that there there's oil and gas underneath this property? I will let Teresa answer there that. There are a number of functioning wells. We get approached by drilling companies on a more frequent basis than we anticipated about the wells that are out there and about new exploration that's taking place. We don't expect that there's going to be a large volume. Um, most of the wells are very small wells that are out there, but we are getting a lot of inquiries. Um, we did negotiate throughout the purchase a surface protection agreement with the, with the um, help of Arthur as well as one of the other attorneys in his firm. And we are use, using him in the oil and gas portion to make sure that the water is protected through that surface protection agreement. Okay, for the water. Um, and I understand there are exotic animals on this uh, property. Uh, how quickly are we talking about moving forward with this sale? Immediately, or after I'll have to ask council to all the animals are dead, or or, or or something like that. Not discuss any details regarding that unless we're in executive session, as it does jeopardize our position on any resale. However, um, there is a ranching and hunting lease on the property right now, so we are evaluating the processes. It's held by the same family who owned the ranch originally. Um, and we did negotiate as well in the purchase some provisions that protect okay. and enhance the wildlife on the ranch. Okay. Any further public comment on item D? With no further public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor of, of um, approving item D, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. We will go to item J on the consent agenda. Three, Article A 14.000, Cemetery Fees, Section A 4.002, Cremation, Section A 14004, Overtime, and Section A 4006, Disinternment to Adjust Said Fees. And this is under item J, which is second reading and adoption of amending appendix A, fee schedule for the following ordinances, which was the item three I just read. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Tina Dersky, Director of Finance. I'm happy to answer any questions or address any concerns. No, on the rest of the fees that we uh, decreased, one of them that we increased was the weekend time. And I was uh, just wanting to get some discussion on if we can keep it as is. Um, just so we don't have pass on any fees for anybody passing away over the weekend and have and or during the weekend have to have a funeral and up to cost just because of that inconvenience. So uh, I know we we decreased the disinternment and I believe we decreased did we decrease the cremation? Uh, 
for the cremation, burial, opening, and closing. So the current fee was $400, and we were proposing a fee of $500. <coughs> the last motion from our last council was it to keep it the same or did we increase we kept it at five hundred dollars okay um i'd like to move to approve if we can de or keep the overtime fees of the i believe twenty five dollars there we are <coughs> twenty five dollar increase Yes, uh, the current increase? fee was $175 for a weekend opening, and we were proposing a fee of $200 for a weekend opening. No, last time I was against this portion because of this, um, so I'd like to move to approve if we can keep the uh, current fee of 175 and the other fees as is, as we discussed last time. Gina, how many uh, weekend burials do we have? In um, looking at the financial impact, it looks like we're uh, guessing about two per year. doesn't happen very often. I was just going to say, um, yeah, two, you look, look at the financial impact, that's $50. So um, we actually wouldn't have an issue with that, Elaine. I think that would be fine. There is a motion on the floor to approve our um, item J3, the cemetery fees, the cremation fees, the disinternment fees, but adjust the overtime fee and leave it as it stands. Um, so not increasing that fee by the additional $25. There's a second. Is there a public comment to this item? With no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor of approving the second reading of the cemetery fees, the cremation fees, the disinterment fees, and lowering the overtime fee by $25, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That would be keeping the overtime as the same, existing. not actually lowering it as existing in the ordinance. Okay. Item J4, Article A11. Dot zero 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 fire and rescue service fees section a one one dot zero zero one service fees subsection f ambulance transport and transfer fees to adjust said fees do i have questions for tina i believe miss somebody DeWitt, pulled it oh, I this one pulled that because one of the constituents in single member district six had a question steve what is your question I still feel uh, that the, this is important, uh, uh, that the, uh, they need to be raised. Uh, the, as, we, as you recall, the, the chief only raised them 5%, and that's 5% uh, over, uh, he hasn't raised them in five years, and I think that's, a, uh, well, I think it should have been done a lot sooner than that, and because uh, um, medical uh, expenses are very volatile, very, and, and we're living in an o time, a time of Obamacare. Uh, everybody should have insurance, uh, <laughs> and um, that this this would uh, we've had uh, great expenses uh, in our fire department, uh, building a new station property, and uh, ambulance service over there. And I feel that uh, we need this this uh, capital to uh, stay even. Uh, that. Uh, I raised the, the prices from ASL 1 to, to 12. It was, uh, it was uh, going to be raised to 875, uh, uh, ASL 2 to 14. Uh, it was going to be raised to 995. Uh, BSL, um, BLS uh, ER emergency uh, to 1,000. From uh, it was going to be raised to uh, it was going to be raised to eight ten, um, and the average costs on all of these are are just I'm I'm not too far out of the park uh, with the average cost among all the prices that were listed on your on your information sheet. Uh, the last one I was going to talk about is BSL non emergency. It was eight hundred. It was it's. 
projected to be raised to nine, uh, 630. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, these uh, costs, uh, I was a president of a hospital board. I, these things vol are very volatile and uh, I, you, you're not, um, your collection fees are not, uh, not everybody's paying their bills, so you have a lot of people that, uh, you have a lot of collections that uh, will sink your boat and, um, and um, mm, that's all I can think about saying right now, but uh, thank, thank you, you Tina, very much. Do you want to uh, re-review those, those numbers with <coughs> us? Do you have those slides? Let's go back over those, please. Well, didn't we look at those? And then Brian and Steve, you may want to stay up here for this, but because we talked a little bit. Brian talked that going that 30%, 40% jump sure might be some sticker shock, but we did agree that instead of waiting three years, we would come back within a year That's and great. look at this harder to make another jump because we just thought that one jump all at once was was pretty hard to choke on this one thing. So You're right. I, but I, I, I see would, Steve's yeah. point, really, I mean, very clearly. That's the reason we discussed it was because the conversation, if you remember, was about the dollar amount that is not paid by anybody mm -hmm. and whether that was incorporated into the new rates or how we were booking the non-payables, unpayables. So I would like for us to just re-review these numbers. We did agree that we would re-review in a year, but we have the slide. Let's review the information. So for fire for ALS-1 emergencies, the current fee is $830, and we were proposing a fee of $875. You want me to just go through each of the The cost types? of service is 1205 Yes, ma'am. That's the average cost of service for those runs. Um, That's we, average cost for all categories. For all correct? categories. We did right. get with our consultant um, who helps us with our, our Medicaid reimbursement, um, and he did get us some numbers. These are 2015 costs of service for each of these types of services. Um, he is going to get us updated 2017 numbers, but he hasn't had time to do that since the last council meeting. But so for the that 1205 is a 2015 number no, for average I was cost going to give you Medicare. another number that he okay. gave us since we last met. Good. Um, the 12, it would be $1,243 for ALS-1, just average for that particular type of service. And we're proposing $875. To the next one. For ALS 2 emergency, our current fee is $955 with a proposed fee of $1,010. And our numbers on that show that the cost of service for that particular type of run is $1,799. $1,799, not the $1,205. Again, the these are 2015 numbers. I'm guessing they'd probably be a little bit higher even now. So, so the proposed fee is 1,010. <coughs> the actual in 2015 is 1,799. So we would anticipate that 2017 numbers are even much higher than that. I would think so. For BLS emergency, the current fee is 770 dollars. We're proposing a fee of 810 dollars, and for BLS emergency, the average cost for those runs is 1,046 dollars. ELS non-emergency, the current fee is $600, proposing a fee of $630, and the average cost of that type of run is $981. And then I think the only other one is the mileage fee, which we're proposing is currently at $10, proposing $12, and the cost of that is $14.16. When will you have the 2017 <coughs> numbers? He is uh, working on that right now. We asked him if he, we just met with him this week and asked him to do that for us. And so as soon as he returns them to us, we'll I would think council available. would be well advised if what we do is wait till we get some 2017 numbers, put this item, these increases on hold until we have 2017 numbers and bring it back to council for review. I agree. That's what I was going to suggest. Since Chief Dunn is not here, that, um, you know, we, I would like to hear from him on, you know, any change that we make to what was put before us that we voted on last time. Okay. Chief Sanford is in the room. Assistant Chief Sanford, have him come to the microphone, and we'll have this conversation today. Oh, okay. Well, he, we, he can come to the microphone, but we don't have the 2017 numbers. And that's what we want to look at. He can yes. talk to the numbers, but we don't have 2017 numbers. Do we know Harry, how long would you like to be? talk? Thank you. Do you know how long it's going to be before we get those particular numbers? 
I don't. I'm certain that we could probably have them by the next council meeting if we asked for them. I think that's what they agreed on as soon as possible, so I'm sure he could run those numbers pretty quick for us. I would like to have a motion, if possible, from council to delay approval the second reading of this and postpone to the next meeting. We need a motion to table. We have to have a motion to table the existing motion. May I have a motion to table the existing motion or withdraw? Move to table. Thank you, Wayne. Second. Thank you all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So uh, we now will have a motion to bring this back as a new conversation with updated information as soon as possible, hopefully the next council meeting. Yes, ma'am. So Thank moved. You. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. We have now completed discussion on the consent agenda. We will move to the regular agenda, item A, <coughs> which is the presentation of the water master <coughs> plan study by CDM Smith. Presentation will be made by Water Utilities Assistant Director Lance Overstreet and CDM Smith Representative Alan Wolke. Good morning, Council. Mayor Lance Overstreet from Water Utilities. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to uh, give you guys this presentation. The presentation that uh, CDM Smith and Alan Wilkie is going to provide was actually done for the Water Advisory Board, and it was uh, such an informative and good presentation. We thought it important to also bring to council so that you guys can understand some of the uh, quality of things that we have been um, ha having and asking for council to approve. And so uh, I've asked uh, Alan Wilkie, who gave that presentation, and, and uh, one of the uh, heads there at CDM Smith, to come in and also give that presentation to you guys this morning. And so. He will be available for questions during that presentation, and uh, we hope that it's uh, very informative to you guys. Thank you. Mayor Council, thank you for the opportunity today to uh, make this presentation. As in a lot of engineering study, there's a lot of detail and a lot of work that was put into this, and we're going to try to condense it down to something that uh, respects your time and, and all the efforts that you're doing here today. But it is for you, so if there are any questions or any detail that you want to get into, I'm more than happy to delve into it, but I just want to let you know we're going to try to keep it at a fairly high level to, to respect your time. The agenda, real quickly, the water master plan consisted of several different components. One was the water model, the district computer model that models the distribution system, its development and uses. How we use that hydraulic model to evaluate the city system and define where there may be issues that need to be addressed. We also had a component of the master plan that looked at leaks in the distribution system to try to save that precious resource of water for the city and make sure that we're accounting for those losses. And then the final part of it was a very interesting thing that looked at asset uh, condition, asset criticality, and how to best deal with the water distribution system that the city has. Just real quick, the water distribution model is a computer model that models each of the individual pipes in the distribution system for flow and pressure so that we can determine where there might be places where low pressure or low flow uh, could cause problems for the, the citizens. Uh, the water development, uh, the model of development, there are 24,000, almost 24,000 pipes in the distribution system model. Uh, most of that data was taken from the city SCADA system, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, GIS system and supplement it with billing data. So each of the customers who has a billing account, we were able to locate that on a GIS map and then connect that uh, meter with a pipe. So the, the data being put into the model is very accurate. We also took SCADA information to uh, make sure that uh, the tanks and other pumps and features in the distribution system were uh, modeled correctly. And then finally, we had interviews with staff to make sure that the system, the model was predicting what was actually being seen in the system. We did fire flow tests uh, probably about this time uh, last year to uh, see what the response of the system was to the fire hydrants being open, measuring flows, uh, pressures and things, going back and making sure that the hydraulic model actually predicted what we were seeing in the field. Now, so we've created this model and it's been made available to the city and the city's being trained on its use. So what, what exactly does the city get out of it? Well, it, it provides quite a few things. And by the way, this is the first one that's been done since 1998. So it's, it's been a while since it's been done. 
Uh, it, it gives the city engineering staff and utility staff the ability to look at future developments or future businesses that come to town and how the, sis, the distribution system can meet their needs, both water needs and fire flow needs. You can look at future development proposals. Uh, you can look at operational things like what if we have to tank, take a tank out of service for painting or we have to do some work on a pump station. How will the system react to that asset not being available? Uh, we can also look at operational changes. If we want them, there are turns within the city. What happens if we move those pressure planes and how will the system react and how will the pressures in the systems be once those changes are made? And finally, the one thing that the, we did look at this one also is water quality. The state requires and federal government requires that we maintain certain uh, disinfection residuals in our water supply and we can model that to see where the water might be getting uh, older and losing that residual. Uh, the distribution system, uh, the model showed that the city system, the good news is it's very robust. Uh, it seemed to meet all the peak hour fl uh, flows. It met fire flow demands. There are a few areas that we'll talk about and show real quickly uh, that had a few issues, but we think that most of those could be addressed by maybe moving the pressure plane boundary. Uh, the demand projection, this is looking at the, the surface water treatment plant, and it has the ability to meet the demands through a long time if we had the water to put in it. Uh, predicted pressures through 2040, the existing maximum pressure is shown on, on the left there. Uh, no issues. And 2040 minimum pressures, uh, you see there's, there's a little bit of an area of, of low pressure uh, in one part of the zone, but we think that that could be corrected by two uh, projects to get more water out into that part. Which color would oh, I'm sorry, the low orange, pressure? Oh, the red, the red and orange, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the red and orange is showing that the areas were low pressure. Fire flow, we, we evaluate every node in the system for fire flow, uh, just so that we can make sure that, you know, if they're in the event of a fire, that flows are available to, to fight that fire. Most of the system had flows in excess of 2,000 GPM. There were some low areas, that, again, shown in red, but we believe that that could be addressed by uh, moving the pressure plane boundary. Higher pressure plant where it says they're high pressure zone, the boundary, if it was moved a little bit to the south, would be able to address those red uh, areas with the low fire. <coughs> uh, chlorine or disinfection residual. Uh, this is looking at areas where uh, the chlorine residual may be dropping uh, lower and would potentially have water age issues. Uh, again, some of them are uh, in areas where the water is being pumped several times and uh, ends up being in tanks and in pipes a little longer than some areas. We, can, we are recommended that we consider combining the lake and, and low zones so that the water re residual water age is a little bit less. Uh, we also look at a regulatory analysis. The TCEQ publishes minimum requirements for distributions for cities, for uh, water providers. Uh, we looked at that. The city has an abundance of, of uh, storage and pumping. The uh, issue is a lot of the storage is in the upper pressure plane, and we think that by the addition of some pressure reducing valves that that storage could be utilized in the lower pressure plane, and everything in the system would be acceptable. Uh, the leak detection zone, uh, leak detection part of the study, we uh, subcontracted and had someone uh, through sonic and visual testing looked at 100 miles of piping in the system and found that the system was in really good shape. Very few leaks were found. Uh, 30 leaks were found in 100 miles. That's really good. Uh, seven of those leaks were service lines. We found some closed valves. Uh, a lot of the uh, meters, uh, a lot of the leaks were actually on the, on the private side. But they were all marked in the field and, and those uh, leaks turned over to the utility department. This is one of the more interesting parts of the, of the thing, uh, of the master plan, and it looked at uh, the assets that you have, uh, all the miles of pipe that you have, and looked at how to best renew that system and keep it uh, in good working order, and how to wisely and efficiently spend your money. Uh, we uh, first of all collected break data from 2011 through 2016. Uh, there were 964 breaks that were provided to us. Uh, we went through that information, located it on a GIS map, and then removed the duplicates that, you know, may have been the same break that just got reported a couple times. And so we analyzed 884 breaks, and you can see them on the, on the map in red there. 
This is also some information that we were able to pull together from the city's GIS system and from uh, interviews with city staff, and it's the number of miles of pipe that was installed by year in the city of San Angelo, and it's color-coded to represent the type of material that was being installed. Uh, you can see in the, I guess from the 40s to the about the late 80s, a lot of asbestos cement, asbestos cement AC pipe was being installed. And then in the later years, since AC pipe has kind of fell, fallen out of favor, that a lot of PVC pipe was being installed. This is be important in, in just a second. So one of the things that we look at is how long the life of each of these types of pipe is. Uh, usually they're running somewhere between 50 and 80 years. And so we start looking at when that pipe was installed and how long it will last, both for an optimistic evaluation and a pessimistic. It's like, you know, when you take your, when you buy a car, well, we hope it lasts 12 or 15 years, but we're happy if it lasts eight or 10. Same type of thing here. The optimistic is that it'll last 50 to 75 or even 140 years here, it looks like. And then if it's pessimistic, it won't last that long. And that is important because, again, based on this graph, you have a lot of different materials being put in in a lot of different years. So what percent would be in PVC pipe right now? Question, and I'll have to get back to you. It looks like it's a fairly significant portion, but I don't know off the top of my head. What would one say that all of those things that were done in the 1930s through the 1964 would be gone and pretty much replaced by PVC? Uh, uh, m most of the pipe is probably in good shape. But uh, we'll, we'll get into what we're going to, how we evaluated that and what we're recommending to the city. You're asking some really good questions, but you're getting a little ahead of me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is just looking at the same thing, looking at uh, replacement. So the, the AWWA, uh, American Water Works Association, uh, recommends uh, an annual replacement of about 1% of your pipe per year. Uh, and that's in order to try to keep up with that age of 100 year, you know, pipes last about 100 years, so 1% per year re replacing about one, uh, is you replacing say 100 years, is that PVC pipe 100 years? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Sure. Could you go back a slide, um, one more? Here in 2014, is that an indication that asbestos cement was there and was present in 2014 or installed? See that little? Tell the color, yeah. yeah. The little green on top. I'd have to go back and check the data, council member. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Would we, would we ever use no, anything think, containing no, I AC, asbestos? No, I don't think AC pipes even made anymore for water distribution. So it may be, it may be that just a little glitch in the data that it's, it's hanging on. But it looks like most of Maybe it's the cap. It's not a reflection yeah. of. Yeah, I it think might it's just a cap be the top. It might be yeah. the top of the of the column. It's the cap on that, not yeah. an indicator of the actual pipeline. What the pipe is. Yeah. Thank you. So one of the things that we did with all twenty four thousand pipes in the in the model was to sit down with city staff and go over the probability of failure of each of those pipes, and and not individual pipe by pipe, but basically created a, a matrix of what would be the probability of failure. Why, in their opinion and in our professional opinion, what would be the reasons why a pipe would break? And we uh, gave each of those uh, probability of failures a ranking from one to five. And you, I'm not gonna go over these, but you can see the, the uh, probability of failure factor that uh, was put in here. One of the higher ones was pressure, and one of the lower ones was whether it was crossing a railroad or crossing a road. Then, then we, more importantly, looked at consequence of failure. Because, you know, if you're looking at pipe replacement and how to wisely and efficiently spend the city's resources on keeping the distribution system functioning well, there's, you know, just because an 8-inch pipe out in the middle of a field serving one or two houses is as, as old as a 24-inch pipe in front of one of the hospitals, Obviously, the 24-inch pipe in front of the hospital has more consequence of failure than an 8-inch that's serving a couple of houses. So this was the consequence of failure matrix that was put together. Looking at each, again, looking at what was important in determining the consequence of failure on a scale of 1 to 5. So these probability of failure and consequence of failure then was evaluated for all 24,000 pipes in the distribution system. 
and a combined matrix was determined, which, ripped, which looked at the total risk to the city's distribution system of both the probability of failure and consequence of failure. So across the top of the, of the matrix is the likelihood of failure from negligible to extreme. And then uh, in the vertical axis is the consequence of failure from negligible impact to extreme impact. And so obviously the things that you would want to focus the resources and money of the city on would be the ones that are in the high and extreme area. The ones where the probability of failure is high and the consequence of failure is high. And there's a color graph there. The, the colors on, the, on the, the street map matches the uh, colors in the, in the matrix. We, we tried to start to put together CIP projects that addressed, you know, meeting those uh, requirements, meeting the, the high, going back one. You can see the extreme, there's about 11 miles of pipe in the city that, that are, are about 1.7% of the, of the distribution system that are in extreme uh, risk and about 70 miles of pipe that's in high. And so we took it to start putting together a, uh, several scenarios of, of investment in the distribution system one that looked at 1% renewal, uh, one that looked at optimistic, again, going to the, the, can the pipe last a lot longer than we hope it can, and then looked at uh, scenario three, which was the pessimistic, there's a shorter life on the pipe, and then finally looking at current renewal. And you can see the, the total cost over the, uh, the period from 2017 to 2042. Alan, do you have any way to enlarge that map on that previous slide? Not with me today. Okay. Uh, we, right. I think that map may be available to the utility staff or we can send it to them if they don't have it. Okay, thank you. The bottom line here is that it, uh, you know, over, a, over the next uh, 25 years, uh, looking at significant investment in maintaining the, the distribution system, keeping, it, uh, keeping the risk of failure and the consequence of failure down low. And of course, this does not take into place into um, reality, the dollars and the, the pipeline and that we've already are working on or in the CIP plan existing. So this is just your projection with current plans for projects not taken into account, correct? Yeah, a lot of, um, and basically what she's talking about, of course, is uh, w along with the uh, infrastructure improvement projects that we have going on as far as the streets that we're working on at this point, all the work that's being done on streets, of course, we're replacing lines underneath as well. So that's part of the plan at this point. What you're showing us right now is the uh, the consequences of the uh, the system as far as not not uh, upgrading our infrastructure, basically. But I know in our part we do have that plan to replace those lines as we go along and do those streets as well. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things that we we looked at was um, which is just going through the different scenarios. One of the things that we were asked to do is coordinate with the street program. So that, so that uh, where there were going to be street replacements and, and renewals, that, that we could factor in that renewal of the distribution system piping at the same time so that that would be updated and, and taken care of in this, in this model. So that was done. There were, uh, I think we worked with the uh, uh, street renewal with the city engineering and with the utilities to, to get those streets and then put together the CIP that would be coordinated with that street renewal program. In summary, we just want to make point out that this water model is an important tool and a valuable asset to the city moving forward, both in modeling its distribution system, knowing how the system works, and then knowing the what ifs if something happens. Uh, this model shows that, that the system is robust; it can meet the peak hour needs and also meet the fire flow needs of the community. Uh, with minor modifications, <coughs> it meets all TCEQ requirements as for storage and pumping. Uh, the good news on the leak assessment was after looking at 100 miles of pipe, only 30 leaks were found. I thought that's really a, a, a testament to the, the work that's being done. Is that a standard that? That's, that's really low. Uh, the, the, the subcontractor who was doing that was expecting to find a whole lot more. He was a little disappointed that, that he didn't have, <laughs> couldn't do more and Yay. see what I found. Uh, the asset and criticality evaluation, which we've talked about here uh, last, uh, shows that age and condition of the pipes must be addressed to reduce risk of failure. So there's a lot of pipe in the system that's getting fairly old, and again, how do you wisely spend your money to keep that asset uh, renewed and up to date? And then finally, we, the CIP was coordinated with the utility and engineering department so that it is coordinated with the street department, I mean with the road replacement uh, program. 
Do I have questions for him or comments from council at this point in time? Thank you for the presentation and the good Thank news. You, info. We will move on to regular agenda item B, authorized negotiation and execution of a professional service contract with CDM Smith Incorporated for evaluation of Lake Nasworthy sewer system for $178,670 which is budgeted in the fiscal year 2018 <coughs> and authorizing the city manager to execute any related documents. And we have Lance Overstreet to present today. Lance Overstreet, good morning again, council. Uh, today I was one to take the opportunity to kind of explain some of the, the reasons and the rationale behind our desire to have the Nasworthy area evaluated. Uh, this morning I'm gonna kind of give you guys a rundown and a little bit of education as far as what the current conditions are why that we are, are concerned about what's going on in Nasworthy in terms of the sewer, and then also, too, just to kind of highlight what this evaluation will provide for us. Um, the, the first thing is that for the Nasworthy area, it's kind of a unique system. And the reason that it's a unique system is because we've all heard that, you know, gravity causes things to run downhill. And th that is the way we want things to happen, is to have gravity take the sewer and things like that, and it actually run downhill and it, and it be effective. Uh, what's interesting about the Nasworthy area is the lake creates kind of a natural bowl. And so anything that's developed around the lake is at the low point. And to get it to actually flow and use gravity, it actually has to be pumped to the point to where it can actually then gravity flow. And so every house primarily that's in the Nasworthy area will go through some kind of a pumping process. And whether that is a grinder pump that actually happens right there at the house or whether that's a lift station that's close by, every bit of the sewer that's in the Nasworthy area has to be pumped out of that area, out of that bowl configuration to a high point where it can then gravity flow. And so I have a picture here of what a, a normal grinder pump looks like. And so essentially what it is is a, a small little containment well that actually takes the sewer from the house, puts it into a little holding container, and then once that level goes up high enough, the valve turns on, the pump and the grinder actually activate, and then it actually pressurizes the sewer, pumps it into the pipe, and then oftentimes it pumps it into a pipe that's up on the road, which is at a higher elevation, that stays pressurized as it moves through the system, and then actually ends up going into a lift station where it gets pressurized again to actually make it over into a gravity system. And so what's interesting about the whole portion about Nasworthy is, is from this map, all of those dark green lines are actually pressurized lines that are around the Nasworthy area. About 95% of all of the pressurized lines we have in the city are actually in the Nasworthy area. And that is just because of the way it's designed, because of the low section that's there. Of everything that goes on there, there is 136 grinders, and those are those little stations at houses that the city actually maintains in the Nasworthy area. Um, the problem with those grinders is that they are going to eventually fail. And typically they're going to fail at a time when it's the, the most convenient for us. Not really. But it's going <laughs> to be usually when it's, you know, those weekends when you have everybody there, when it's, you know, the, the family is there at big events, things like that. And so the other thing that's interesting is we have a little over 50 lift stations here in the entire city. The Nasworthy sewer goes through 21 of those. So almost half of the lift stations actually will see the Nasworthy sewer. Now that's a problem because as you guys mentioned, those little tanks that they have to go into and that the sewer sits into before it actually has the elevation to pump it out, that actually if the sewer is sitting there for a length of time, it actually has a buildup of bacteria and becomes what they call septic. And what that means is those bacteria begin to gas hydrogen sulfide gas and it actually begins to actually be higher corrosivity than normal sewer that's just flowing gravity. So you can imagine that a weekend house where someone has gone into the, to the Nasworthy area, enjoyed a weekend at the lake, uh, they leave, they're not back there for a couple of weeks, there's a portion of that sewer that's sitting in that tank for a couple of weeks becoming septic, then when they come back and they flush it, they don't really realize it, but they've actually now introduced that gas, introduced all that stuff into the pressure lines, those pressure lines then go into the lift stations. Those lift stations end up getting pumped into the rest of the sewer system. And so then that septic corrosivity actually gets transmitted into the entire sewer system, the 21 other lift stations, all the other pipes, all the other siphons and everything else that's here in the city. And so the Nasworthy area, there is a lot of problems with mechanical failures. 
and equipment failures because of the fact that this is highly corrosive, it is highly septic, and because of also, too, the pressures that we have going on out in that area. Um, the current system is really op operating at an overcapacity. And the reason why I say that is because over the years, and, and if you look back in what the Nasworthy area was 20 years ago versus what Nasworthy is today, it's a very different view. Uh, a lot of what Nasworthy was 20 years ago was very small little um, you know, weekend houses or very small fishing houses that families would go and they would enjoy for a couple of days. And a lot of those houses have been torn down. Larger houses have been built. Uh, further development has occurred. The airport has developed. There's a lot of different areas in the face of what Nasworthy has has changed drastically over the last 20 years. The, the problem that we have is that the current infrastructure that transmits all that sewage is the same as it was 20 years ago. We've just added more and more capacity onto it. And so what we have a system is right now is that it's really operating at overcapacity. And what that means is that if you're gravity flowing something, it will flow you know, a pipe about 50% full. Well, what we are doing is by pressurizing it, we are actually flowing more through those pipes. And how do you flow more through that pipe? You just continue to increase the pressure more and more to flow more and more through the pipe to get the stuff to flow. And that is one thing that we're seeing, not only on the volume, but also on the pressure side. And you guys can imagine that if you have a, a grinder pump at your house that's, that's failed a couple of times over the last five years, you want to not have that continued cost. And so what are you going to do? You're going to go in and put a, a more powerful grinder pump so that way it will last longer. And what you're doing is you're actually increasing the pressure at the grinder pump well, that means now your neighbor who had a less powerful grinder pump, theirs is not going to work as efficiently. And so what ends up happening is you just continue to increase the pressures more and more to flow more and more volume. And essentially, you just end up chasing the failures along the system. And so what we have going on is we have a system that's over capacity. We have uh, an increasing pressure requirement because we're trying to keep up with the increasing volume requirements. And really where we are at this point is we have a, a precious commodity that is NASworthy that we want to develop. We have an airport system that we want to develop. We want to be able to market. We want to be able to grow those areas. And, and realistically, the system is so over capacity right now that we are almost in a point where we say we can't continue to have development because we can't guarantee that there's going to be sewer to flow. And that's really where the system is at right now in terms of where those conditions are. What this evaluation is, is really we're hoping to do is it's going to kind of identify if there are areas in the system where maybe the loading isn't as high. You know, can we do some, some small projects to shift where some of that loading may be to relieve some of the stress on some areas, increase in other areas? Uh, is, the dire is the area we're going to and routing things now, is that the best or is there going to be a better uh, long-term fix? So that way, as infrastructure is developed, we can make some changes on that, uh, reroute some things, uh, shift those loads around. The, the other thing that we have is, is, is there really an option for a gravity routing? Uh, we have actually done some preliminary inf uh, looking, and we believe that there may be a point with a fairly significant pipeline that rather than routing things through the city, it may actually be able to be rerouted a different direction and go to the plant and be a gravity feed option the entire way uh, for the most part. Uh, we also have a, a facility that's at the airport that currently isn't being used because of some regulatory uh, updates and costs to do that. It may be that that system could be viable to be upgraded and, and, and be a fix for us. Um, there's also, two we wanted to identify areas that are higher priority. Um, where are those areas that pressures are continuing to build that are problematic? What areas do we need to be focusing on to begin with? And... A lot of these things, you know, we have discussed as a water utility department. We've discussed uh, with the operational side of things. And, and uh, the reason that we are really asking for this evaluation is because over the years, we have done a good job of keeping the system running. But at, at times, it has not been something looking forward as to, okay, in 20 years, where do we need to be? How do we need to get there? And, and what's going to be take? What does it take to do that? And what this evaluation is going to do is they'll actually be able to set up flow monitoring so that way during those peak events like the race events and the weekends, we can actually have monitoring of those flows to know what kind of the impact the system is having. Um, what's happening in rain events? Are we getting a lot of infiltration into the system that's overloading it during rain events? And then also, too, the, the, the whole idea of this modeling this system so that way as things go ahead, 
what happens when we put a lift station over here? What happens when we want to model a new hotel over here or a new larger business at the industri industrial area at the airport? What kind of impacts is that going to have on the system, and where do we need to be looking at in the future to make sure that that happens as far as our future development and loading? And so the whole idea of this is that we are, we are asking for you guys to approve CDM Smith to do this modeling for us. One of the reasons that we chose them was uh, primarily because they already have much of that information available to them. With the water master plan and the water study this, and the evaluations that we have done, they already have the inflow information as far as the amount of usage on the water side. They already have a lot of that modeling done. And so it just makes sense to continue because they are qualified. They do have those expertise and abilities. It makes sense to have them on board for this next piece of this and the continuation of this particular project. Um, My only question is how fast and when will we have this back? I believe that there was a schedule that was included in the packet to you guys as far as that. And so if you guys approve it today, then they'll be uh, on the road in the next week and be on board with that. So, Do I have questions and or further comments from anyone on council? Just, just a comment. Uh, a good portion of that is in District 1, and it has, uh, it, it has impacts as far as I would say maybe as, even as the crow flies, maybe five, six miles away. Um, it, it, it impacted some business. At the high, I'm talking about the hydrogen sulfide gas last summer um, impacted some businesses adversely. So um, I, I would make a motion that um, we uh, approve staff recommendation of uh, hiring uh, CDM Smith for uh, this evaluation of the sewer system. Lane has seconded. Do we have public comment? Steve? Uh, uh, Steve Hampton. Um, uh, he used overcapacity. I guess he was using saying overcapacity of use. Uh, it was being overused, uh, and uh, that it was under pressure. Also, the buildup of of so, uh, so um, septic acid. gas, <laughs> which is a pH problem. Which uh, is uh, you know, if everybody contributed a little Ridex, uh, would that solve the problem? And it, it, it's it maybe a simple solution. Uh, as far as the volume and, and, the, and the flow, um, I, you know, I, I, I think it sounds like there's a, a need for this, uh, this look, but there, there, it may be just a simple solution is what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Thank you. Well, we will ask all of our citizens to use RX this weekend and see if that solves the problem. Um, I, I think use of that could cause some other problems at the plant that we don't want to have to, you know, the, the plan is designed to handle that thing when it gets to it. I don't think we want to, as a as a, a rule of thumb, have the entire city begin to flush Ridex. I think that would. <laughs> I'm not even sure there's enough in the where in yeah. the. Uh, I have a septic tank. To take and I'm care a, of that, yeah. so they might have to double their order over the next if, few weeks. If you get With that I'm being a, said, I I'm still I'm think it's a good game plan. I have a septic tank, and so if you guys approve this, I'm going to go buy mine now before it sells out. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Any further public comment? If there's no further public comment, then we will take a vote to approve um, this contract with CDM Smith for 178,670. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? With none opposed, um, item 6B passes 7-0. Item 6C, consider resolution authorizing the Water Utilities <coughs> Department to develop a program <coughs> offering utility account rebates to customers owning qualifying homes for participation in water quality testing required for city compliance with EPA national primary drinking water regulations. And the presentation today will be by Allison Stroop, who is our U water utilities director. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Um, so you may have seen some of the press releases and advertisement that we've been doing on Facebook, but we are trying to um, enroll residential customers in our lead and copper sampling program. Uh, it is um, mandated by the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and regulated here in Texas by TCEQ. Uh, due to our recent census population reaching over 100,000, we are required to send in 100 samples from these residential homes. Uh, this is a significant increase from what we've been sampling previously. Um, and they're very particular on the type of homes and the plumbing that's associated with those homes. And I'll get into that 
a little bit more here in a second. You're done, Allison. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Um, what we need to do is produce a list uh, for TCEQ to approve. Um, because we have to send in 100 samples, we need a list of approximately 150 homes that fit this uh, these parameters. And that's because we know that when people, uh, we ask people to participate in this program, um, someone might forget, they might forget to set the, the, after they take the sample that morning, they might forget to set it on their front door because we'll be just, that's what the homeowner will do. They'll take the sample, put it on the front door, and then we'll go by and collect all those. Um, and so we know there's some amount of error that can occur, people forget. Uh, so we need over that amount to get the full 100 into uh, testing. Um, like I said, the testing will occur every six months. Um, and we're targeting homes that are built between 1982 and 1988. Uh, those homes, uh, the homeowner must also confirm that they either have copper plumbing with lead solder, lead plumbing, or a lead service line. Uh, so these are what are considered tier one sites, and TCEQ requires that we have uh, the bulk of our uh, samples be conducted on these type of homes. Um, so as I've mentioned earlier, we've done a press release. This has been featured on San Angelo Live, Standard Times, other news media outlets. Um, Tim Combest and our water quality folks have made appearances on KSAN, KIDY, KLST. Um, and Anthony's been doing a great job of helping us advertise this on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter. We've also been coordinating with the appraisal district to try to target those homes that were built during that time period. And we've gotten a list from them of about 2,800 homes that are built between that um, time. But with those efforts, we are not seeing many people participate. Um, and so we are trying to take this to the next step. This is a regulatory requirement, and we definitely want to meet those. Um, and so our, our next step is to offer or to incentivize these customers to come forward and to participate in the sampling with us. So we're asking uh, today to do a $50 one-time rebate to their utility bill to encourage these customers uh, to come and uh, volunteer their home as well as take the samples. Um, but ultimately, we're just trying to really uh, get to the residential customers and try to get this enrollment um, up and going. How many do we have enrolled at this point? I think we have like 20. And what happens if we don't get 150 people? Um, I, maybe Tim could help me with that answer. I have Tim Combest, our plant operations manager, and he oversees this program. Um, I'll let him answer that question. We don't, uh, if we don't get the 150 or the 100, uh, it'd probably put us in a violation with TCEQ. I haven't heard anything about them postponing any of it, so I think everything's still on schedule. How far outside the 82 to 88 range would they allow you to go if, if you can't get mm -hmm. in within that range? If we can't find the Tier 1, there's a classification for Tier 2. Uh, we can do some multi-family... Um, buildings um, we can go uh, even tier three which could be a 1940s home okay thank you very much do i have um, questions further comments from council when would we have to make the decision to go beyond the 1982 to 1988 because from what if we only have 20 people that have responded and we've been doing all of the media advertisement mm -hmm. and soliciting people to come forward it sounds like we're going to have to do something so i guess one of my questions would be what is our deadline to start our program and you know do we just need to move forward with expanding the year range that the home was built we have to send our selected list in the TCQ for approval, they have to review it. They say they'll review that within five days. They'll send that back to us. Then we have to schedule the sampling. Uh, we have to get the samples in, and then from there we have to approve the contract. Uh, we have to uh, get the contract approved. Would you speak more into the microphone for us, please? You can maybe move that microphone up a bit so it's a little easier for you. All right. So. Today, what we're, we're going to do is to ask for support on the Consent. parameters that you currently have set up. 
And we, I was just going to add, we also have drafted a letter following this council meeting that will target those specific 2,800, 2,700 homes. Um, and so we're going to do a mail out specific to those. So we really hope that we do get the bulk of our um, enrollment from those 1982 to 1988 homes. Uh, but we are targeting those areas specifically. Uh, but we just want the letter to include the rebate or not, whichever way council decides to go um, but we do have that ready to try to send out this week Daniel, did you have a comment no, i was just going to say 2800 homes i think that with the incentive the 50 dollars uh, credit i think we'll more than likely get the people that we need in there so i don't think it's going to be an issue as far as going to a different tier it's just a matter of getting the letters out with the uh, the credit uh, available to them so do i have a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the water utilities department to proceed. So moved. A second. second. Do I have public comment? With no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor of the recommendation by the Water Utilities Department, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Passes 7-0. <laughs> Next item is 6D. Consider awarding RFQ WU-04-18 Professional Services Hickory Groundwater Supply Development to Improtec, Hibbs, and Todd in the amount of $534,000 for Task Order 1, budgeted for purchase in fiscal year 2018, and authorizing the city manager to execute any related documents. <coughs> and Allison, I guess you're on again. Yeah. So as you're aware, um, it is council's desire as well as the water advisory board that this project uh, move forward with the expansion of the Hickory project. Uh, this would be the final expansion uh, to meet our permitted capacity. In uh, November of last year, we sent out um, RFQs for engineering firms to submit their qualifications. We received four of those in January. Uh, we formed a selection, a selection committee that ranked these proposals based upon project approach, plan, uh, the key project personnel, firm qualifications, and the firm location. Um, the top ranking submission was by Improtec, Hibbs, and Todd of Abilene. Uh, the scope of what their submissions included uh, address well field production capacity. So as you know, we currently have 15 wells. We can expand that up to 22. Uh, pump station capacity and treatment capacity. Right now we are, reg or not regulated, but we are at a capacity of around 8 million gallons per day, and we can increase that up to 12 million gallons per day. Um, what we have for you today is uh, task order one. Uh, engineering contract with Improtec, Hibbs, and Todd. Uh, some of the highlights of what this task order includes is a project management plan. This is required by the Texas Water Development Board. Uh, it will develop the overall master schedule as well as the uh, OPC or opinion of probable cost and budget. And it kind of lines out how the project will proceed from here. Um, the next part of it is the application for financial assistance. Uh, this uh, project is in the state water plan, so it is a or it is capable of receiving state funding from Texas Water Development Board. Um, if you'll recall, the $120 million loan that we received for the first Hickory project was also uh, from the Texas Water Development Board. How much assistance did we get from them? The $120 million? $120 million, yes. And then also the bulk of this task order one is in the basis of design report, which is per, uh, which is preliminary design. Um, that basis of design report will include five technical memorandums. Uh, this will go into detail of the preliminary design regarding how many wells we need to drill, um, the details of those wells, the collection piping, pump station improvements, um, as well as improvements needed here at the water treatment plant to bring in that full 12 million gallons per day. Um, EHT is also partnering with uh, LBG Guyton, which is now WSP, and Park Hill Smith and Cooper out of Lubbock. Uh, but this team includes hydrogeologists, civil engineers, uh, structural, mechanical, electrical, um, and this will really be the preliminary design for uh, the full build out of this. Uh, this too the is the also- The water treatment plant? Or the water, the wells as well as the water treatment plant? All the above. Um, 
Oh, this too is also required uh, for state funding, so through the Texas Water Development Board. Uh, the This basis of, or this preliminary report is also required for that funding. And I would assume part of this had been done when we did the other 15 wells. So the question mark would be what information was produced with the first 15 wells that isn't that is unique and different to the next development phase of the other additional wells? None of the engineering for the additional wells was completed during the first project. Uh, so in order to produce the permitted allocate or permitted production, uh, there's even enhancements that are needed to the current well sites, uh, whether that's lowering pumps, putting in larger pumps. Um, and so none of that engineering was uh, performed at that time. It was uh, when they executed the engineering documents for that, it was to pump and produce and treat 8 million gallons per day. So this next phase of engineering has not occurred. So we're not overlapping in any engineering work regarding this. Um, I just wanted to add that um, we're asking for um, to enter in a contract with Impertec, Hibbs and Todd for $534,300 for task order one. Um, I did update the water advisory board at the last meeting regarding this and they um, are wanting to move forward with the Hickory expansion. So they seemed on board with this. Do we have questions, Harry? Comment, thank you. Uh, this is, <clears throat> if we're gonna get out 40, 50 years for, for water, we have to do this. We've got to drill more wells. We've got to increase the capacity at the water treatment plant. And we've got to find ways that, that will allow us to, uh, to do this. Uh, the good Lord has not let it rain in, in several, uh, several weeks. And at 20% of our main water source, if we don't do something, uh, we could be in, in dire need of, of water. So we have to do this. I, I, I very much support this. Tom, do you have any questions or comments? No. Billy, do you? Lane? Lucy? With no further comments or questions, do I have a motion? Um, a motion? I'd, make, I'd make a motion that we uh, award uh, RFQ WU0418 to... Um, uh, in Protec, Hibbs, and Todd, an amount of $534,300 for task order one. Second. Second the motion. Is there public comment? Do we have any public comment on this item? If not, we will go to a vote. All in favor of approving this um, RFQ, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Item D passes 7-0. Item E, consider awarding RF, RFB PK-01-18 construction of a restroom building at the Texas Bank Sports Complex to <laughs> Justice Construction Incorporated of Abilene, Texas in the amount of $395,000. This is a budget project in the fiscal year 18 authorizing yeah, the city manager to execute half, right? any related documents. And you're, um, David, you're going to present today. Okay. I'm Mayor Council, David Knapp, construction manager. Um, if you remember, we brought this to you, and I'll hit that uh, in a minute, uh, in September, and we did a redesign, and so this is kind of the results of that. Just a little history on the bank sports, uh, Texas Bank Sports Complex. It was a project renovated back in 2008. It was a half-cent sales tax project, and it was a total cost of about $10 million. So it was quite a renovation and for that uh, area and this is what it was before and this is what it has become um, certainly a, a feather in the cap of the city with uh, all the tournaments that uh, and activity that goes on out there um, so there's four different quads here color-coded and um, so we're trying to enhance you know one of those quads as we move forward um, this was in the Little Caesars quad, the first quad with the little uh, with the little league fields, and this is basically the uh, restroom concession building that we were attempting to recreate 
for the, uh, I think it was the Twin Mountain Dentistry Quad. Um, and this is what we priced in September. It came in at 740000 um, So in the Twin Mountain Dentistry Quad, that's the second quad there, um, the biggest complaint, obviously, is that there's no restrooms. Um, there's been teams that would ask not to play at that quad, and certainly there's been a few tournaments that were lost because we didn't have adequate facilities. Um, by adding these restrooms, obviously, players, parents, and grandparents will no longer have to walk or run uh, the 1,500 feet you know, there and back to use the restroom. Um, uh, so a little history, you know, we bid this originally uh, early 17, it came in at 850,000, we had one bidder, uh, did some scope revisions, we got two bidders, and the low bid at that time was 750,000, that's what I brought to you guys, and um, council rejected it, so we redesigned the project um, with this in mind, obviously the price was, uh, offensive so we said let's um, look for ways to reduce utility runs to the building uh, AEP worked with us cl very closely we were able to cut that electrical wise in half uh, they're gonna put a little a new pedestal for us that we can uh, so it eliminates half of our uh, trenching and, and uh, utility run uh, we did eliminate the concession space and it, you know, we eliminated it entirely, so there's no future, oh, let's come back and put a concession in there. We, it was expensive to go ahead and put infrastructure in for something we may or may not do. So um, we eliminated the columns, the round roof, the mast and cables that you saw on that previous uh, slide. Uh, we minimized the amount of concrete worked around the building. And... So really, the original restrooms remained intact as designed, and it matches the other restroom uh, facilities there. And another big, uh, by eliminating the concession and the amount of the roof overhang, we were able to eliminate the fire suppression system. So uh, with that, we were able to bring the, uh, let's see, yeah, the, so the low bid on this one was 395000 So quite a big uh, reduction in cost on, uh, for the redesign. So just to give you an idea of what, what the redesign looks like, in plan on the right is the original uh, building, uh, the restroom. You can kind of pick out the, the restrooms there and the concession on the bottom half. Uh, we've eliminated the, the concession. We've eliminated the round roof uh, entirely and that related to a bunch of columns and uh, footings that went with that. Um, now we just have a simple roof that uh, covers the box of the restroom with a little bit of overhang on one side. And this is uh, kind of in elevation. What you'll see on the bottom is what was at the, the first quad um, with the, the columns all the way around the round roof and the mast in the middle that had cabling. The, the original design intent was to add colorful banners on that each, you know, to go along with the color coding of each quad. So that's gone away and we've gotten down to the simplified uh, box with a little bit of an overhang. And, and uh, so this is the revised uh, look. So um, we recommend moving forward with uh, Justice Construction. They're out of Abilene. We, again, we got no local bidders, but uh, happy to get Justice Construction. They do, they've actually just completed several um, restroom concession buildings for the city of Abilene and uh, come highly recommended. Um, our project budget um, after the redesign fee was 623000 and of course we came in at three ninety five. dollars and uh, work should, you know, if, if approved today we can issue a notice to proceed and work could probably be, begin in 30 days and take about 135 days. Do I have any questions or comments from council for David? How, today, how much is our revenue? How much do our maintenance costs exceed revenue on this sports complex? Uh, that would be a parks question, Roger or Carl. Um, I, b I believe the revenue covers the the 
maintenance costs, though. Well, it does not, if you go into the watering of fields, all that kind of stuff, it, it does not, as you're talking maintenance as in water costs. That's our big cost over there. Go ahead, Carl. Question is, is how much does our maintenance cost exceed our revenue? It's an entire complex versus the revenue that we receive. Mm -hmm. We get about $100,000 in program revenue, and the maintenance cost is, is it six about 700000 So we do exceed maintenance cost over the direct revenue, but the economic impact is what far exceeds that, that cost to maintain the complex. We never factor those in. That's just actual revenue brought in versus... And, um, you know, every year, of course, we know that it costs $10 million to develop, which was far in exceeding the original number projected for development that complex. And it seems like every year we come up with more money that needs to be spent on this complex. So are we kind of at the end of spending additional monies to get this? Because I know that not having the restroom wasn't the only reason we lost some of <coughs> these tournaments. There were multiple reasons for losing those tournaments. Can answer and that a little bit. These dollars actually are, are dollars that were allocated under the, the half cent sales tax for this type of project. So it's it's completing out some of those things. Um, but as far as additional things out there, you know, there have been. There's at the time we built it, there were only two sets of restrooms built. So this is building the third one. So the uh, fourth quad, since the fourth one still does not have restrooms. So that may be something that the city wants to add at some time. Having restrooms at every quad just increases your usability. Uh, they may decide, the city may decide, if it's looking at the economic impact that you want to add another quad. You know, so at that point you could do that. We built it in a space where we hoped there was land available to do that if the city ever so chose. So the goal ultimately is that economic impact number and growing those tournaments. And, and I will say for the staff point, uh, the Recreation Department's done a great job of, of bringing those in, and I think they're doing a great job of getting additional ones that are looking at us as what well. What is the economic impact? I don't have those numbers, but we could run those for you and give them to council. Uh, if you, I think we've given you all kind of those numbers in the past, but we could run you new ones as well. Thank you. I would like to see that. Further questions or comments from council? Do I have a motion to approve item E, awarding the... RFB for $395,000 to build a restroom facility for Quad 3. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Public comment, please. Uh, Steve Hampton, I, I have only uh, uh, one question. I said they just uh, finished uh, several uh, improvements in Abilene. I was wondering what their cost was there what the Abilene spent on it, uh, if they're, how much they're charging us, how much more uh, are they charging us to, to come down this 100 miles or so. Um, that's the only thing I have. Further public comment? With no further public comment, we will take a vote authorizing the RFB for 395000 All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7-0. Mayor, before you move on, I would like to acknowledge this is David Knapp's last meeting. He has taken a job in the uh, Austin area, moving up in the world, and uh, has uh, some opportunities he's going to take advantage of. But he has been invaluable to the city and uh, a lot of projects over his time here, about seven years now. Uh, you've seen a lot of those that he has been instrumental in helping us move through and save dollars. So thank you to David for his service. Uh, to the city, he'll be greatly missed. You will miss us. <laughs> we might miss you, but you're going to miss us. <laughs> Thank you, David. Except for last September, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will move to item F, which is public hearing and consideration of a resolution approving an update to the city's community development plan or neighbor revitalization plan and expanding the community development target area map to include designated neighborhood areas. And we will have Bob Silas present today. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, staff is recommending uh, approval of some changes to the neighborhood revitalization plan. Uh, we uh, are recommending expansion of the target areas uh, to include uh, 
Lakeview, and oh, that's not the wrong one. So there's a map there somewhere. Oh, no map. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess uh, I guess we'll just uh, talk about it. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, we want to expand uh, into the uh, Lakeview and Beller areas. Um, after conducting some analysis, uh, which included some demographics, uh, we looked at household incomes, uh, age of the housing stock, uh, rentals in the area, and then we conducted a uh, windshield survey. And uh, staff has, uh, has recognized those two areas as uh, potential candidates for our plan. Uh, if approved, the new target uh, areas will, in, will be eligible for affordable housing um, assistance program, and which will, of course, will expand the housing stock in those areas. So we're asking the council to approve uh, the changes to the, uh, to the plan. Do we have questions for Bob? Since we have no map, just look at you. <laughs> we've got a map in our we've got a map in our packet. We do. You do have a map. Yeah, I did. Yeah, we I did. submitted a map in the in the um, in your packet, so that should be uh, should indicate what areas oh, there, there, there we is. go. There's That's the map we're talking about. Basically, no map was not actually. Yeah, accurate. right there. We're talking about this area. Note here. that, please. Oh, can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Up up north, Lakeview, and then Bell Air near Goodfellow mm -hmm. Air Force Base. Those are the two areas we want to expand into. Tom, did you have a comment? Okay. Do I have any further comment or questions for Bob? If not, I would like, oh, Lane, do you just expanding here? the area that make it capable of helping out with the incentives? That's correct. Uh, we want to expand our programs into those areas. Move to approve. A second. Second. All, uh, public comment, please. With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approving. Um, the city's community development plan update, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nick passes 7-0. We move to item G. I will ask council, does anybody want to take a break real quick or do you want to just keep moving forward? Five minute break? Okay. Let's five minute break. I'm gonna I'll keep working. Just keep going. Got these poor audience out here. They're ready to get all this stuff going on. I promise you a five minute break and we will reconvene. It'll be fast. <coughs> to start off with item G one, which is case C P one eight dash O one, an amendment to the comprehensive plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood center to the commercial future land use category being 7.2 acres located at 717-729 West 29th Street and 2825 to 2929 North Bryant Boulevard, changing certain lands from the industrial to the commercial future land use category, being 3.56 acres located at 2609-2635 <coughs> North Bryant Boulevard and 606-610 Art Street, and changing certain lands from the neighborhood center to the industrial future land use category being an unaddressed 2.64 acre track located southwest of West 29th Street and North Bryant Boulevard. So John, you're on. And my presentation will actually be over one and two, so I don't know okay, if you could go ahead Okay, let me go, go ahead and read, read it. Two. Case seven, I mean, case Z18-04, a rezoning from the light manufacturing ML zoning district to the general commercial CG zoning district being 4.65 acres located at 717-729 West 29th Street and 2829-2901 2829 North Bryant Boulevard. Okay, so you are on. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this started off with a, a property in this area. This is uh, 29th and Bryant. Uh, it came in for a conditional use. As, as we looked at the surrounding area, uh, you can see here, we are proposing rezoning and comp plan change for all of that area. Uh, what we noticed was that there were a lot of uses in there that aren't currently compliant with the zoning. Um, and so some, some commercial uses that are industrial in industrial zoning that's not allowed and uh, those kinds of things. And so this is really a cleanup of, of the whole area. Uh, you'll see in a minute on the map, there's no opposition has been registered to this. All of the businesses uh, we've talked to, and they're fine with uh, those changes. Um, so, um, again, this is uh, both a rezoning and a comprehensive plan amendment. This is actually the comp plan amendment. 
but you can see that there's a lot of uh, industrial here, commercial here, and the neighborhood center, which is another kind of commercial uh, in, uh, across the street. And so again, basically all this is doing is the areas that are actually being used as industrial are going to the industrial classification. Uh, the ones that are being used as commercial are going to a commercial classification. So there would be no negative impact on anybody's existing zoning? Correct. In fact, it cleans up. There are a couple of uses, uh, one of which is actually technically operating illegally on the site that they're on, uh, and this rezoning would fix that for them. You still not no, I, uh, I can come back to that. I was going to skip that slide anyway. But Slow down. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. I know. I know. I'm getting like, two of them. There you go. Let's we already it. took a break, so we should slow down. I, I think this is the last one. That if uh, we did send out our notifications, we did receive responses in favor, but none in opposition. Uh, staff recommendation is approval, and it comes to you from uh, the Planning Commission with a unanimous recommendation for approval. Uh, and it will take two motions, one for the comp plan and one for the rezoning. And there's no negative impact in the long term of some business trying to sell their business or their location based off of this change? That's correct. Again, we talk to every business that this affects, and uh, in every case it either is no change for them or it's a change in the direction of, of making them no longer nonconforming. Okay. Lucy, did you have a motion that you would like to yes. make? <laughs> yes, sir. I made you approve and present it. Second. Do we have public comment? With no public comment, we will take a vote. Oh, yes, ma'am. Is that motion for both? Oh, yes, ma'am. For both uh, one and two. So with that, we have a motion. We have a second. We have no public comment. We have a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 7 0. Item H First reading and public hearing of ordinances approving one case CP 18 02, an amendment to the city's comprehensive <laughs> plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood to the neighborhood center future land use category being 1.2 acres located at 530 West Avenue T and 509 and 517 and 535 West Avenue S and H2 case 7 I'm sorry case Z18-03 a rezoning from the single family residential RS1 zoning district to the neighborhood commercial CN zoning district being 0.85 acres located at 530 West Avenue T and 535 West Avenue S John you're on Thank you. This is a similar case in that it requires both a comprehensive <coughs> plan amendment as well as a rezoning, uh, although this one is all at the request of the applicant. Uh, this is a church location, and over the years, uh, as they bought up surrounding residential properties um, and it, looking at expanding both the church and the parking, um, that is a nonconforming use in the residential district. Uh, and so rather than continuing to get a, condi a conditional use every time they want to expand or do something different, uh, this rezoning would just fix the issue for good for them uh, for their future plans uh, on that site. Um, so again, the, you can see the boundary here. Uh, everything along Bryant is commercial, but then everything behind is residential. This would extend the commercial designation out to include all of the land owned by the church. And, and likewise, it would rezone all the church property from the single family residential district to a commercial zoning district. Um, we s did send out our notifications, did not receive any responses in favor or in opposition. Would you go back to that other, s the screen before that one? This one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is just a summary of the re recommendations from staff, uh, from our staff report. Okay. does come to you with the recommendation of approval from staff as well as unanimously from the Planning Commission. Do I have a question, Billy, Lane, Lucy, Tom, Tommy, Harry? Harry, okay. Do I have a motion? Move to approve as presented on both items. Second. Is there public comment? With a motion, a second, and no public comment, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7-0. Item I, 
first reading and public hearing for an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Exhibit A, Zoning Ordinance, Article 4, Section 402, Accessory Uses and Structures to eliminate subsection C.1.A.2III for the purposes of clarifying the language regarding constructing accessory structures. You may recall a few meetings ago we brought this to you. This is the issue regarding patio homes and uh, relaxing the requirement of a 10-foot separation between buildings. Uh, this would allow uh, porches, pergolas, those kinds of things to be uh, within five feet of the adjacent home instead of within 10 feet. Uh, as we've processed some of these, um, this one uh, provision in the ordinance became a little problematic and in talking it through with the fire marshal, uh, we determined that this uh, part of the ordinance was actually not necessary. Uh, it was creating some issues for some of the folks who wanted to build a porch that otherwise met the requirements but could not meet this requirement. Uh, again, this was originally inserted based on discussions with Fire Marshal, uh, but now we believe it's it's no longer necessary, so this would remove this particular provision from the ordinance. And basically what this provision uh, currently requires is that the roof of such a porch or pergola be substantially open, meaning it couldn't be a solid roof. Uh, it would have to be like intermittent uh, roof on the the top of the structure. Uh, but we've had some folks come in with some proposed construction that the fire marshal was okay with, uh, but violated this provision. So the awning wouldn't be allowed, but the pergola would. An awning would also and be so allowed. So that's not considered uh, open. That's considered open. Right. What what this would have what this currently allows is either an open structure or an awning that's flame resistant. Okay. This would allow a solid construction roof like a porch, um, if you vote to remove this. Yes, Billy. Question. If that was a safety concern originally um, about having the totally closed roofs, why wouldn't it be a safety concern now, John? I think as we saw some of these come in for their permits and as we reviewed them, uh, we determined that these can be done. Uh, there are some other requirements already in place that they be flame retardant, and I apologize to Ross if I'm using the wrong words here, okay. but uh, there are ways to make them um, better for fire protection purposes, but still have a solid roof. And so with those already in place in the ordinance, um, in re-looking at this, we felt comfortable removing this particular provision. Does that answer the question? That answers my question, but I'm still not sure I'm totally comfortable with it if we thought it was a safety concern, but you're saying that Ross is not seeing a problem when they come forward with Correct. It, by having to meet these other standards like the flame retardant paint or uh, metal construction instead of wood, some of those kinds of things that they have to do if they're so close, um, that the roof being open does not pose as much of an issue as we originally thought it would. That's only if it meets those standards. So if they didn't get a permit, then we can't confirm you know, that it was built to those standards. So by coming in and doing that, we can correct that. Okay. Billy, are you okay with it based off of that explanation? Um, yes, I will okay. be. Thank you. Do we have further questions or comments from any council members for John? Then do I have a motion for approval of item I? I'll move. A second? Second. Second by Harry. Oh, is there any comment, public comment, on item I regarding the new ordinance amendment? With a motion, a second, and no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 7-0. Item J, consider first hearing of an ordinance amending one Appendix A, fee schedule by creating Article A3.000, business-related fees, Section A3.015, alcoholic beverage fees, and two, amending Chapter 5, business and commerce, Article 5.02, alcoholic beverages, regulations, Division 2 license. Tina? 
Nadirsky, Director of Finance again, Mayor. Thank you. Um, today, most of our fees in this cycle uh, that we're bringing to you today are fees that are already in existence and have been approved by a city council in the past, but have not yet been adopted into an ordinance. And so we're just kind of cleaning that up and making sure that we have all of our fees in an ordinance. So there's no additional fees or increases based off of approving item J? Item J, no. For billing and receipts, it's the um, alcoholic beverage permits and things like that. Do I have any questions for Tina from anyone on council? If no questions from anyone on council on item J, um, may I have a motion? Move to approve. To approve, it's presented. And a second? Second. Do I have public comment? Oh, sorry, yeah, I'd Teresa. I'd like to point out this actually has the two portions to it. The second one is amending the language in the alcoholic beverages portion of our code of ordinances to direct people to Appendix A to see the fees. So it's just one of those cleanup provisions, but we do need a motion that encompass, encompasses both of those. Okay, so is my motion to include one and two? It is. And the second also includes one and two. Public comment, no. Then we have a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7 0. Item K Consider first hearing of an ordinance amending Appendix A, fee schedule Article A15.000, facility use fees by adding Section A15.003, civic events facility use fees to provide for facility rental and related use fees. This gets pretty complicated. Uh, here again, there are we are adopting these fees into an, an ordinance as well for civic events. Um, most of the fees are just being adopted into the ordinance. We did come with a recommendation from the board that there are some um, items that are rather minute and, and cost usually, but they change at a faster rate than we review fees, and so they would like to have the board to have discretion to change those fees on a more regular basis, and those are those that are listed in front of you right now. And tell us what those are. <clears throat> Additional tables after the 20 complimentary, chairs after 150, dinnerware, fencing, forklift, linen napkins, stage lighting, staging and risers, table skirts, tablecloths, water and coffee setup. So does that mean that we haven't been charging for those items where the numbers aren't listed, like the dinnerware, fencing, forklift? So those have all come as part of the rental fee itself in total? I would ask... Mr. Carl White to come help me with that answer, please. Yes, we, we have been charging f for these different fees uh, at different rates. The ones we really don't use often are the, um, the staging and the risers. It maybe happens once a year. It has to be on pro our own property for an event such as SAPAC if they ask for it. Um, the fencing, we provide the fencing for virtually all events. It has to be for... Um, an event in which the city concessionaire isn't providing the alcohol, which is very rare. Um, but yes, we are charging. Some of these are really just pass-on fees for like the the napkins and the table skirts. Um, so but I know, but, but if we're asking for approval on additional expenses that charge fees, what are those? Like linen napkins, I'm sure we charge something for the linen napkins right. now. That, right, that's a misunderstanding. We're actually charging fees for all of these that are listed before you. The change that we're requesting and that comes as a recommendation from the board is that they have the discretion to change these fees more often as the costs associated with them are changing. Instead of having to come back to council for these, what is it, 11 items, the board would be able to make those changes as needed. Do I have questions <clears throat> from council? So, um, yes, Mayor, I have a question. Please, so, Tina, um, if we were to exempt, you know, the Civic Events Department from having to come back to council on these 11 items, would there be a limit placed on how much um, the increase could be? Or is it, for instance, um, I know I've dealt some with the, you know, paying the additional cost on the table skirts, tablecloths, linen napkins. And that's a very reasonable, you know, fee to charge, but say they wanted to, you know, do five times that, sure. could they do that without coming back to council? As, uh, in the way that we have it presented right now, I believe they could um, 
at their sole discretion increase it at whatever they feel is right. Um, we could put limits, I'm sure, into the ordinance to limit them to a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount or something like that if that was council's preference. Well, I think it needs to. we need to make sure as a council that it's equitable for everyone at the same point in time. I don't want one organization being charged more than the other. And I would assume that some of the differences are based off of the vendors that you use because otherwise, you know, most linen napkins are the same price day in and day out unless the linen company has an incremental increase in their laundering costs, et cetera. So I'm not really sure I understand what we're trying to accomplish here. The same thing with table skirts and tablecloths. Are, are we, are those vendors that we're bringing in or do we own those things? And, or are there just vendors that are bringing in this stuff and we're passing on their cost to the customer or are we adding a cost to the vendor's cost and passing it to the customer? Provided by another vendor, they charge us. We, we pass that cost on, on to the, the renter of the facility, but it's, it's always just barely over the, our cost to us. And Carl, the, a renter has the uh, ability to go out and find their own tablecloth mm -hmm. provider as well. We don't have to provide Correct. Them, right? So they yeah. have the option if they want to go yeah. get their own. Tom, you have a... I think where they're going, with, a lot of times when we have rentals, we will run out. If we have three rentals multiple weekends, we have to go out and subcontract that from somebody else. That person, the city may have the same thing. So how I read this is it gives somebody the flexibility to get what they need to take care of a customer. I wouldn't say putting a limit on them at all because sometimes they may even have to go outside of San Angelo to get tables and skirts and things like that. So I got no problem with this and I see the, the rationale behind it. Okay. Council, any other comments on this? Any limitations, Billy, that you feel need to be put out there? I just feel there needs to be some parameters, and it's not that I don't trust the Civic Events Department, but I just think if, you know, we're going a certain percent over where we're currently charging people, we need to have some idea of, you know, that there's a check and balance. You know, so oftentimes when we don't have that check and balance, then things get out of hand and, you know, it comes back on whoever's made the decision to do it. So I would like to see some parameters um, put on that. I certainly understand what Tom said. He's had a lot more experience with, for instance, stage lighting and stage uh, risers than I have, but I still think that... Well, you could make a motion that says the fine. I recommend that we allow the civic events group to um, add 10% on to their price, their quoted price. Yes, Teresa. I would like to clarify that the people making that decision is not staff, but the Civic Events Board. So that's your check and balance. Staff will not have any discretion to raise those fees. It will be a board and that's done at a public meeting. So it's not like Sydney or Carl can just raise the price of napkins. But you could, Billy, put a parameter and say um, we could not charge in excess of X percentage if you wanted to, for example. Or you could say I'm okay with the civic board making that decision. I would like to see us um, put a parameter of if it exceeds 25% of the current cost that, um, you know, we would need to take a look at it. I don't That would apply for any pass on fee because some of these fees are for like tables and chairs, items that we already have. And we have a current fee for those, right? Correct. So that fee is set. So if we have to go above that current okay. fee of 25% is what, what I'm saying. Understood. Is that reasonable or am I being too picky on that? Somebody that push back if you think. <laughs> no, it sounds reasonable. But we don't have to go up to 25. No, but just up a, to. The cap. You know, if it goes over 25 percent. Then it would have to come to council. Is that what you want? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the motion um, made by Billy DeWitt is to um, allow the Civic Events Board to um, increase the fees and costs on these items, but not to exceed 25 percent. That is my motion, yes. Okay. And is there a second? I'll second that. 
Is there public comment? Lost in thought. Steve Hampton. Uh, I like the idea that Billy had. Uh, I think 25% uh, uh, may be a little high for me. Uh, I would <clears throat> roll it back a little, but uh, and that's in a single year of uh, increase of fee. So, and I, I also I had this. You had 150 chairs. How many you usually do you usually rent out at a time? What's the average usage? Uh, you setting? can have a 200 unit person in. One of the rooms for an event, so, right? So we're we're we have we set that too low, to, or or where we're going to make more every time, or is it? Uh, Define that, Carl. Uh, in other words, we currently have a fee that says it's this fee until you hit 151, and then at 151 you pay an additional fee. That's correct. And does that mean we have to go out and get the other chairs from someplace, and that's the reason we want additional? We have, or is it the labor involved in putting out all those chairs? Yes, it's related to the labor. But we own the chairs. Yes, we own the chairs. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Any further public comment? With no further public can, comment. Can I just clarify one thing? Yes, we're, we're approving this, um, giving the board the discretion on these fees, but we're also approving the adoption of all of the other, other fees, fees, correct? I just want to make sure that's clear in the, in the motion. So. Okay. Yes. With that, we will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Item L. Consider first hearing of ordinance amending Appendix A, fee schedule, Article A13.000, health and sanitation related fees by adding a new section, A13.005, nursing division fees. And Tina, you're on. So this one is, I'm sorry, I have my slides were out of order, I think, so let me find those. Which one did you just read? Um, item L, the health and sanitation related fees. So this is the one where I think that's the right one. This should be the right one for that. Um, so these are the nursing fees um, that we charge. Uh, currently, none of these are changing. They are adopted with a set price for copies copies of medical records at five dollars. The sampling collection fee at twenty dollars. STD appointment and testing would be twenty five dollars, and STD follow up appointments would be ten dollars, and then TB testing would be twenty dollars. Is that five dollars? Go back a minute, please. Sorry. Is that per page $5 on a copy of a medical record, or is it $5 if there's 30 pages, is it still $5, or if it's two pages, is it $5, or is it $5 per page? I'm going to ask Sandra Villarreal to yeah. answer that question. Good morning. Good morning. It's the whole record, so whether it's one page or the entire page, it's the $5 record. Um, how many pages are there usually? Typically, it's one or two, and really the, the majority are people that are needing their immunization records for school, for work. Um, those are actually the majority of our records uh, that are, that are uh, asked for. Okay, thank you. For nursing for the hepatitis panel, the current fee is $65. We're proposing, we're proposing a fee which would be the cost of the reference lab service, which is basically just passing through whatever the reference lab charges the city, um, plus the sampling collection fee, which that's a set fee of $20 no matter what you know, you're know you having done. Um, and then the cost of service on that is $66. So we're proposing a fee of $65 with a cost of service of, I mean, I'm sorry, the current fee is $65. We're proposing to pass it through for this one, plus the sampling collection fee. And so the only thing we're talking about right now is changing, is leaving the current fee $65. So instead of the current fee of $65, we're, we're proposing to whatever the lab charges the city, that would then be what the patient would pay. 
These fees, are there any of these fees that are offset by grants or monies coming in from the, the state or federal government on anything? We do receive um, grant monies for uh, the 1115 waiver, and that um, provides support for the STD clinic. Um, and that money is very specific in how we may use it. Um, it it's for costs associated with operating and maintaining the clinic. So with that, do I have a motion um, to approve the new fee schedule? So moved. A second. Oh, I'm sorry, I have more. more. I, you just took a break, and sorry. it looked like you were through. So I would think I you were only have on oh, oh, I only I'm have sorry. 39 yeah. more slides. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's not fair to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I put those break slides in there, so you don't feel like I really have 120. <laughs> Um, nursing uh, herpes testing, pardon me, current fee is $85. Again, here we're proposing to just pass through the cost of whatever the lab service charges us um, in addition to the sampling collection fee, which is the set so $20. So what would be the difference between, for example, the current fee is $85. We're saying we're going to pass through whatever our costs are, but the cost of service is $109. Do we typically get $109? No, our current fee is $85. I know, but you said that... What I want to know is we're saying, well, whatever the lab is charging us, we want to charge the person. Does that mean your cost of service would traditionally be 109 or is there even a difference between the 85, the 109, and what actually lab charges us? I think us? what the lab charges is based on timing at the time that the service is provided, and I would ask Ms. Villarreal to, yeah, I'd like to kind know of what tell you how they do that. number is. Okay. Again. Okay, so we have a reference laboratory, and it doesn't matter what reference laboratory it is, they will charge us a set amount for any particular testing, whether it's herpes, whether it's a, uh, hepatitis, the titers, MMR, and she's going to get back to the MMRs. Any of those reference lab, lab services we send off to this reference laboratory, depending on what the lab charges us, is what we charge the patient in addition to the collection fee. So currently, actually, based on this, we are proposing $109, but we're actually being charged a little bit more than the $85. If you take away, well, not actually not, 109 minus 20 is what the, uh, the laboratory is actually charging us currently. And so we're just trying to basically just recoup the price of the lab plus the sampling fee, just the time, the supplies, uh, medical supplies that we use um, to collect that sample to send it off. So does that mean $90? So approximately $90 approximately would be $90. the fee compared to our current fee of 85 But yes, we're not settling on a number. What you're asking for is approval for whatever the lab charges us, exactly. not a set fee. Exactly, anyone. So, I mean, we, it could be that tomorrow or the next day we we find a different laboratory that will either, uh, that might uh, do the testing for us for a little bit less. So we will bring down that cost to whatever that lab is going to charge us, plus add that $20. So it just depends on the laboratory that we choose in that particular time. Can, can we? Um, yes, please. You know, uh, state it such that it's, you know, whatever the lab charges not to exceed the cost of service at a $109. Um, was that a Tina question? Can we do that? <coughs> We could do that. Um, the only thing would be that if the lab at some point were to charge us $110 and we're not able to pass that through, then we're losing money. Does that, does that make the sense? Way, the way it's actually written in the ordinance is actual cost plus sampling collection fee. So it is the actual cost that we're paying, and then they're adding the $20 sampling fee on top of that. So it would be the $109 plus 20 no, ma'am. Currently, we're charging $109. That is our current cost of service, and that does include the $20. So um, that means that the, the lab fee right now is actually $89. It's a little bit more than what we're actually charging. So we're only, char we're only having the patient pay us $85, but we're paying out $89 to the lab, so we're losing that little bit. 
of revenue We're just that asking to cost. have actual costs. We're not trying to make it a profit center. We're just trying to get That's our right. actual costs back. Yes, Is that the best way to yes, say it? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, MMR tighter, the current fee is $60. Pro uh, we're, all, again, proposing to just pass through whatever the reference lab fee is. Our current cost of service for this one is $87, meaning that the lab service is approximately $67 plus the $20 sampling fee. Okay. For nursing varicella titer testing, the current fee is $35. Again, um, proposing to pass through the cost of the reference lab service plus the sampling collection fee, and currently our cost of service is $46. And the nursing fees waiver, um, this one is just changing the ordinance, I believe, the language of the ordinance. Um, the health services director shall have the authority to reduce or waive fee schedule fees designated under the section for services provided at scheduled outreach clinics. <clears throat> But I thought what we were trying to do was to collect the cost, not waiver the fees. Because it says to reduce or waive fees, which doesn't sound like it's in sync with what we were just talking about. I'll ask Ms. Villarreal to come up. I believe this is related to when they do outreaches to try to bring people into the clinic to get more of the community um, in, into the clinic for help. So. That's correct. Certain times we will have outreach clinics, especially for our STD clinic. Oftentimes we will go to Angela State to um, participate in their um, HIV World AIDS Day or any um, health fairs um, and, and different events out in the community. And so what we will do, again, for this STD clinic, we will um, provide free STD testing. And also that helps us with our measures for that 1115 waiver. So that gives us the numbers, the measurements that we need to basically reach for that waiver in addition to providing services to the community. So yes, basically we, um, we try to maybe at least have one free clinic even at the, the facility. Uh, we actually are trying to plan something for Public Health Week, uh, 1st of April. We want to go ahead and provide free STD testing during that time. And so there will be certain times of the year that we will do this in addition to our regularly scheduled clinics. Andrew, could this one specifically state that it's for STD? Right now it leaves it open-ended. Yeah, and it could. It could because that's really help a specific to clarify. For STD. Because it sounds odd to be talking what we were just talking about, and then you have this out there. It now the seem only like they now, now the only thing, thing because at some point in time, there might be somebody that does come along and they they have a child and they need their immunizations and they really cannot afford it. So we can either waive the fee, then the 1485 that the child will pay for the immunizations, or maybe take a reduced cost of the, of the uh, administration so th that also kind of fits into that because we will and have done that not often but we will do that if there is someone that really is in need they've got to have them but they just don't have the money those are primarily because those two programs are, are subsidized through the state provides us the vaccine they just um say that this is how much you can um charge for the administration but the vaccine itself is free the through the texas vaccines for children and so really it would just be uh what we do basically would be offset i mean we would actually just be waiving uh, the cost of us providing the free vaccine so but that doesn't come around often but it does happen so what were what was the dollars attached to that last year that's, like I said, is very, very rare. About the wave, any waving, it's very rare. Uh, very rare. And in that case, We like, just need to have it in there in case yeah, the very rare if, thing happens. If, I, if you were going to put that in there, I would limit it to those two programs, to the STD, which yes. is clearly being funded by that system. And the only other one that we ever have it in is if there is a, a need in that immunization. And it, of course, as I said, as Sandra said, is funded. The, the, the vaccines are all funded by the state. So I would limit it to those two programs if you're gonna add it. So we could have the motion be inclusive of those two items. All right, is there further 
things that we need to go over here. That should be it for nursing fees. Do I have additional comments or questions from anyone on council who would like to speak? If not, do I have a motion? SPD and the immunization. Immunizations. Okay. Second. All right. Any public comment? Uh, if, if it's uh, good for one thing, it's good for another. Billy brought up that we should have an oversight. Uh, uh, and so when you're having, uh, uh, you have discretion like this, uh, maybe, maybe uh, before doing it, she has to call uh, Rick and uh, get permission from him or something of that nature. So there's, uh, because the other one had a board, this one does not have a board. So uh, that's my feeling about it. Would anyone want to consider changing the motion to have limitations put on the STD or immunity? Immun well, they would call Rick. <laughs> and Rick, what would I you think say? I should be offended. Uh, Rick needs to call me after that. <laughs> and, and you could add that it's, it's someone from the approval from the city manager's office, Daniel or his designee. Do you want to include that in the motion? Well, that, that's kind of slapping Sander in the face, in my opinion. Um, she, I, I trust Sandra. Um, uh, to me, that seems like we, we, we're always not wanting to um, insert government in things. To me, that's the, in, inserting something in there that, that is something that's not necessary. I trust Sandra. So we'll leave I, the motion as. I'll leave the motion as is unless some. some the, and that had a second. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, Harry. Uh, <clears throat> we do this and other things within the, within the city. We do it for civic events. Uh, even though it's after the fact, but when Sid has to make a decision on bringing a, bringing a concert in here and he negotiates, uh, we have a panel or group that reviews all those things uh, and to make sure that we have. So I, I don't know that it's a slap in Sandra's face as much as it is as to a uh, citizen out there that just said, hey, we do it for one other organ, uh, one other uh, group. Why shouldn't we do it for all the way across the board? So, I think that's one of the problems we have, and we don't have specific numbers that say this is how many times last year we needed to waive the dollar because of someone's inability to pay. So, council should have a need to know what the those numbers are. Is it a hundred dollar thing on an annual basis? Is it five hundred dollars? We say it's not many, but what's defined many for me? So the question mark is we need to identify those costs. And if you know the costs, then it's easier to make a decision in terms of whether we need to give somebody the authority or not. If we're putting something in place um, to prevent future issues, it's one thing. It's another if, in fact, we're not controlling some negative costs by not knowing the information. With that, there's no change in the motion. We either uh, vote the motion down um, and recreate a new motion. So let's take a vote. All in favor of leaving it as it is, say aye. aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 Passes 5-2. That was as is, but with those two changes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, next up is the removal of some planning fees. Um, there are no proposed increases and no financial Im in impact. We're just removing duplicated fees um, from the ordinance. And if you'd like for me to read those fees for you, I can. That's item M. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't read the caption. Huh? <laughs> you didn't read the caption. Would you like me to I'm read sorry, it first? I got ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read it now. <laughs> I will ride to, I will now read to okay, M. Okay, sorry. Consider, um, First hearing of an ordinance amending Appendix A, Fee Schedule, Article A9-000, Planning Related Fees, by amending Section A9.002, Planning and Development Fees, repealing the fees for rehearsing, for rehearing, requiring renotification. Boy, that's hard. Rehearing, requiring renotification. Amending Section, and go ahead, say it ten <laughs> times fast. Yeah. 
amending Section A9.003, planned development fees by repealing the fee for zone change sign deposit and refund for sign deposit and deleting in its entirety Section A9.009, fees for sign placement or erection, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. I tried not to make you read that. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, again, so this is there's no proposed increases um, or financial impact. Uh, we're just removing duplicated fees from the ordinance. And if you would like for me to read those fees to you so that you're aware, I can. Yeah, what sections are in? Okay, so rehearing requiring renotification, $50. Um, it will be replaced by the new advertising fee that was adopted by council. Um, zone change sign deposit per sign was $37.50 and refund, refund from sign deposit per sign of $25. They're already duplicated in section A9.003. And then sign replacement fees in article A9.009. Fees for sign uh, placement or erection are duplicated in the ordinance appendix A. Fee schedule section A2009 sign permit fees. With that being said, is there? Did you I, want you to yeah. I want you to read that again. Yeah. Could I read M for you yes. and then you could repeat to me what you just said? With that, are there any comments or questions for Tina on item 2M? With that, may I have a motion? motion Lane makes a motion, presented. second by Harry. Is there public comment? With no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 7-0. We will move on to item N. Consider first hearing of an ordinance amending Appendix A, fee schedule, Article A13.000, health and sanitation related fees, Section 13.001, restaurant permit fee by adding a fee for additional service area in addition to the annual food establishment permit fee. This is um, a, a fee that we already uh, have in, uh, established that we are just putting into the ordinance. And it is $25. So it's no additional fees that anyone's No making. increase. Okay, so we're just making an ordinance out of this. Yes, ma'am. From previous approved. Do I have a question or a comment from anyone on council for item um, N? With none, do I have a motion? Move to approve. A yeah. second by Lucy. All Any public comment? No further public comment. We have a motion, a second, and a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Item O, first public hearing, an introduction of an ordinance amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2017, and ending September 30, 2018 for capital projects. This is a budget amendment that will fund some capital projects that were brought to you, I uh, believe it's the last meeting by Sid Walker, our civic events manager. Um, we're simply creating the budget so that he can complete those projects that you approved at that meeting. Are there questions or comments from council? Move to approve. So all in favor, I mean, sorry, public comment, please. No public comment, the motion and the second and the vote, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Passes 7-0. Item P, update on sales tax revenue performance. Tina. Sales tax is up this month over the same month last year by 14.93%. Our collections for March were $129,000 over the original budget for March. And for revenue, we're up by $822,000 year to date. It's amazing to see the increases Abilene, Midland, and Odessa had, because Abilene's been sort of up and then down, and but pretty, pretty strong performances there. Yeah. Can and I keep your presentation going? Because I, I bet Daniel yesterday that we wouldn't be done before the oh, chamber. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> sales tax by industry. Uh, I'm glad you I asked. I can talk. Yeah, I said 11:30. Nobody believed me. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Charge. okay. Thank you very Good much idea. for the charts. Yes, ma'am. Provided. It's grandly appreciated. And But just to note as a comment, for all of those who pay attention to cities that we try to compare ourselves to but have no relationship to, are the, the sales tax dollars of Abilene at $23 billion million, 
Midland at 32 million, Odessa at 30 million, Wichita Falls at 15 plus million, and San Angelo at almost 14 million. We are not sister cities as it relates mm -hmm. to sales tax increase, so we all need to keep that in mind as we move forward. We are not close to those cities at any level financially. That is correct. Which also affects our property taxes, but let's not get into We won't get right into now. that yet because we're working on the I really can't get you through to 1130. <laughs> yeah, no. about. I got you there almost. All right. Um, with that, item 7, follow-up and administrative issues, we have item A, consideration of approving various board nominations. One is the Development Corporation Elizabeth Grindstaff SMD3 to an unexpired term ending February 2019, and Oscar Casillas SMD6 to an unexpired term ending February 2019. Do I have a motion to approve Elizabeth Grindstaff to the COSA DC board as well as Oscar Casillas at the COSA DC board? A second? Second. Any public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Passes 7-0. Fort Concho Museum Board, Roger Banks, my appointment to a second term ending January 31st, 2021. Do I have a motion on that? So moved. A second? Second. All, any public comment? With no public comment, it will be approved. Uh, a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Debbie Wilson, SMD 4, to an unexpired term ending December 2018. Move Do I? To approve. A second? Second. Any public comment? With no public comment, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The Planning Commission, Joe Self, SMD 2, to an unexpired term ending January 2020. Do I have a motion? Move. A second? Any public comment? Motion passes 7 Oh, did I take a vote? No. We need to vote. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Second, I mean, any nays? No, passes 7-0. Public Art Commission, Cynthia Lackey, Mayor, to a second term ending April 30th, 2019. Do I have a motion? Move approval. A second. Any public comment? With no public comment, motion a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Second. I mean, all opposed? None. Getting ahead of myself. Zoning we Board of Adjustments, Debbie Cunningham, SMD 1, to a second term ending January 2020. Darren Fentress, SMD 3, to a second term ending January 2020. Jean Cornell, SMD 6, to a first full term ending January 2020. Jim Turner, as mayor, to for mayor, to a third term ending January 2020. Gary Cortez, mayor alternate, to a second term ending January 2020. And Aaron Nelson, Mayor, alternative to second term ending January 2020. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Um, any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Do we have any announcements and consideration for future agenda items? With none, do I have a motion for adjournment? Move, we adjourn. A second? second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay, we Daniel. are officially okay. through at 11.19 a.m. Okay.